Okay, are you ready for Ecclesiastes? Great. Okay, we're going to start in chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 6. And here's what it says. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen upon earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way, the spirit comes into the bones in the womb of a woman with child. So you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed. At the evening, withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Father, we thank you for your word. Just as we spoke and we sang about it this earlier in the service, God, your word is eternal. It's settled in heaven. It's alive. It's a powerful. It works inside of us. It reveals our thoughts and our intentions. It always does what you say it's going to do. What you send it for, it accomplishes. So, Lord, accomplish what you want this morning. Speak to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm thinking about this scripture this morning, and I began to think about uh, some of the things that we go over in our fit class. By the way, the next fit class is just in two weeks. So it's the 7th of October. The FIT initiative is what helps you to understand more of who God's made you to be and who God's made you for. So how many of you have taken the FIT class so far? That's great. That's about maybe half of you. So the other half, you're welcome to come. Free breakfast, free lunch. It's awesome. You got to come. It's good. Uh, it's really a blessing because it helps you be able to understand where God might, maybe to clarify where God might want to use you in the body of Christ. But there's one of the things we do is we do Strengths Finder, which is a tool for helping you understand your talents. So there's two strengths that I think really kind of come out here in this, in this passage. And one is the strength of deliberative. Okay, deliberative is someone who's really talented in seeing potential risks. In other words, okay, I see your plan, I know what needs to happen. I see the road you want to go on. We're here. We need to be there. Here's the way we want to go. But you know what I also see? I also see all of the potential risks. I also see in that road, there are potholes. In that road, there are mudslides. There are, who knows, landmines. I don't know what dangers are in this road, but we need to think this through. Before we go, think it through, right? So that's in the deliberative. It's uh, foresight that helps us avoid catastrophes. Or Jesus told a story about a man who, who uh, that he said, you don't build without counting the cost, right? If you build a building without counting the cost first, sometimes you get started and you have to stop because you didn't think it through first. So a deliberative is a person who thinks it through, which is a strength. The only problem with that is, also, it can help you really, like, uh, become almost paralyzed, almost like paralysis by analysis. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, ever doing. So it's like, ready, aim, 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 and you never pull a trigger. Okay, that's that's possibly what could happen with a deliberative. The other strength I'm thinking about is an activator, and some of you are activators now. An activator. She wants to move. She's a momentum person. She wants to, uh, she's wondering, why are we sitting around talking about things? Why don't we just keep, why don't we just get going? Because doing something is better than doing nothing, right? Why are we standing around? You can go and you can make adjustments as you go. But let's just move. You know, sometimes she's got this inner compass that, that knows what needs to happen and she's just She's moving forward. So she's a person who's making decisions quickly. And, but sometimes she doesn't think things through all the way because she's moving. So she's like, ready, fire. <laughs> Aim. <laughs> okay. 
So, so, we, so there are strengths and potential weaknesses in both of these ways of looking at life, right? So what is your approach to life? I don't know. How, how, um, yeah, if there's wisdom in both, right? But we need each other. If you're an activator, you might need a deliberative in your life to say, hey, did you think about this? If you're a deliberative, you definitely need an activator in your life to go, <laughs> let's move, right? But I think what this passage is talking to us about today is really, really practical. It's really about decision-making. And decision-making is tough in our day for a lot of different reasons. I mean, if you, there, there's a such thing as decision fatigue. I have so many options, I'm not sure what to do, right? Like when you walk into Baskin Robbins and there's 31. I don't know why there's 31. Why is there not 30? I don't understand that at all, but 31 ice creams to choose from. It's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting stressed just walking in. I came to get ice cream, which is supposed to relieve stress, right? <laughs> but I'm getting stressed. It's easier for me because I know I'm getting chocolate, but there's seven kinds of chocolate. Ah, I don't know if I like this or that, you know. So give me a taste of all of them, and I've already got a lot of calories before I even get my scoop, because I've got this taste I'm going, right? Yeah, so I was just in Africa where that there is no ice cream stress at all, because there's not, there's not ice cream. It's like, if there was, it would be one kind, and it probably would be, I don't know. Uh, so there's not decision stress, but there's other kinds of stresses, which are just as stressful, right? But the problem with decision-making for us, like in, in the Western world or like in first world circumstances as opposed to third world circumstances, is that there's a lot of variables in this game of life. And so it feels like the rules are changing sometimes because circumstances are changing and outcomes are unpredictable and it's like things are broken and we need wisdom. I don't know what to do, how to step forward. So the teacher here is addressing two different kinds of mindsets, right? And so one, one mindset is defeatist. Like, you know, everything is just, I mean, whatever's going to happen is going to happen, just whatever. You know, forget about it. You can't do anything about it, you know? Paralyzed by life, basically. But the other kind of mindset is, yeah, in the face of all of this uncertainty, we're still going to act. And that's really what he's saying here. Yeah, sure, things are uncertain. If you've noticed this, the way this book is laid out, wisdom is almost like a character in the book. It's like, a, it's like a, one of the main characters in this book. And so we're trying to find wisdom. We're looking at the, the best way to live, but we got a problem. And the problem is there's brokenness here, right? There's a plot twist. Everything is hevel. That's the word. That's the Hebrew word, hevel. Can you save it? No, no, no. It's hevel. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Okay, now wipe your lips now. This hevel. Everything is hevel, and it doesn't really mean it's worthless. It really means it's enigma. It's it's uncertain. There's no real way to wrap your yourself around it. And trying to figure it out is like shepherding the wind. He says, shepherding the wind. It's like okay, grabbing grabbing the wind. You know. So everything is hevel. It's temporary. It's shifting. We're trying to figure it out, but it's hard to figure out. And he says one way to live life is as a hedonist. A hedonist is someone who believes pleasure, the, the pursuit of pleasure, is really the only, is the only thing that, that is important in life, pursuing pleasure. Basically, it's just it's, it's, uh, fulfilling your appetites. That's what it is fulfilling your desires. But the teacher tells us even that is hevel. Because even though things are a blessing, like your job, um, your family, your relationships, your money, all these things are blessings. Still, they don't fill you up. They don't scratch that itch that you have inside. There's still something, because you were made for something greater than just the satiation of your appetites. <laughs> you were made for heaven. You were made for, for God. 
You were made for a relationship with him. So these things are blessings, but you can't expect them to fulfill you. If you try to look for fulfillment in them, it's heaven. But I think today's passage is really very practical because it's talking about how do we make decisions? How do we live the best kind of life in the midst of brokenness? And how do you manage uncertainties? Okay. And I think the big thing that he's saying here is even though things are unsure, whatever you do, don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. You got to take a step because the weirdness of life can paralyze you. Sometimes the things we've gone through, what we've experienced can paralyze us briefly. But he says, don't do nothing. <clears throat> so I would listen to this podcast periodically uh, by a woman named Emily P. Freeman. And she has this podcast called The Next Right Thing Podcast. Okay, And it's about decision making. And her whole point is decision making you know, making decisions is one thing, but really the, what's important is how we make those decisions is important because the decisions we make are making our life. So it's not just making decisions. It's really how you're making your life out of those decisions that you're making. So she did this poll on her social media, and she polled people, and she had this question, uh, do you consider yourself a decisive person, or do you consider yourself an indecisive person? Okay. And then she asked the question, why? So decisive, indecisive. Well, 70% of the people said, I'm indecisive. 30% said, I'm a decisive person. So she asked, OK, but why would you say? If you think you're indecisive, why are you indecisive? So here are the reasons. Over 3,000 people responded, by the way. So here are the, we the reasons. Why are you indecisive? Uh, one answer was, I overthink. I feel like I need to have all the possible outcomes before me before acting. It's classic deliberative. Think it through so much that you're paralyzed, right? Another reason I'm indecisive is that I don't trust myself. That's a real thing. Another reason is there are too many options. Fear of better options is a real thing. I, what if I make this choice, but then I find out I would rather have done that later? And so I don't do anything. Well, that's not a good way to live your life. <laughs> it's not really living life at all. One reason people are indecisive is uh, I'm a people pleaser. I just don't want to disappoint other people. So I'm afraid of doing things that might disappoint people. But the number one reason people gave for being indecisive is fear of failure. I'm just afraid of choosing the wrong thing. So I'd do nothing. Mm. So she asked the question to those decisive people, why do you feel like you're decisive? One reason, I can see the bigger picture. I can imagine the big picture so I know what I need to do now based on the big picture. Another thing is, quote, momentum is better than stuckness. Stuckness is a word, apparently. Stuckness is not good. You know, we gotta do, you can't just sit around. you got to do something. It's a classic activator answer, right? Move. Another uh, answer is because I can change my mind. I can pivot if I need to. Let's move, and we can adjust later. Another reason is I know my values, and my values guide me. I know what to do based on the truth that I know. Truth leads me. So I'm decisive because of that. Yeah, so what we're, we're really kind of talking about here is, is moving or not moving. You see how this is really practical, isn't it, day to day? What is my present season in life? Do I wait on God or do I move? And this last week, one of our support team that was, it's on my, uh, the publishing company who's publishing my book, Chrissy Nelson is her name, and she wrote this on her social media. Uh, she said, sometimes we wait for God to move, but other times he's waiting for us to move. If you're in a season of waiting, I encourage you to seek the Lord on who is supposed to make the first move. <laughs> Good advice. Faith is action in the direction of God's call. If you sense he's wanting to open a certain door, why not take the first step and see what happens? 
You move and then watch God move. If he already said he'd do it, why not take a step of faith toward it? If not now, when? And I've found that there, there are times when you need to stop and God is saying stay, and there's times when he is saying go. And I've learned that there's some things you, you only learn about God by being still. Like when Jesus called his disciples away to a quiet place to be with him. Stillness with him is how he revealed himself to him. Or when Mary sat in Jesus' feet, and she was there listening, and Martha was the activator. She was moving. But Mary was sitting listening. Sometimes you, you can only learn about God by being still. But sometimes you can only learn about God by moving. Like when the disciples climbed the mountain of transfiguration, Jesus said, come on up. And, and so they're climbing. And this was a mountain. These are real mountains up there, over there. And it's like, this is a big hike. They had to move their bodies. They have to make an effort to be able to see something that God wanted to, to show about Jesus. So sometimes we only understand things about him because we're moving. And sometimes, so what do you do? Do you move or do you not move? That's the question, right? I think there are seasons of waiting. And, and during those seasons, we have to obey. We have to wait. But I think there are seasons of moving. And I think our text today is talking about the tendency to be paralyzed by the confusion and the brokenness of the world. So I think what he's saying is don't do Nothing. Don't do nothing. What did he say? He said, whoever watches the wind will not plant. I mean, if the wind's blowing and I sow my seeds, it's going to blow the seeds away. I'm just going to have to wait. I'm watching the wind. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. If, you, if you're just looking around and seeing what's going on, if you just watch the news, if all you're doing is watching the news, you will be paralyzed by fear. I'm just telling you. Sometimes that's the, sometimes the greatest thing you can do is just, <laughs> that's awesome. Just, there's a great proverb that says, there's the, the fool or the slothful man, he says, there's a lion in the streets, so he's going to lay in his bed because there's a lion out there. You know, there's too much danger out there. I'm just going to lay in bed. That's not an optimal way to live your life. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> it's not the best advice. Hevel doesn't mean we should surrender and do nothing. If you look in this passage, there are all these verbs. Cast your bread on the water. Plant. Give. Sow. Reap. And he literally says, do not let your hands be idle. Don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. And he says, you don't know the path of the wind. We can't predict the weather. Right? Especially in East Tennessee. They try. Bless their darling hearts. They don't get it right most of the time. It's a hard place to predict the weather. You know the, we know the wind blows, but we don't know where it's blowing, Jesus says. And we can't control it. We can harness it a little bit, but we can't control it. And I love this. He says, you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with a child. Beautiful picture. I was thinking about when, when Katie was born, my firstborn, and I was just sitting, I was holding her, and I was thinking, I was just thinking, I was so, I'm so small. <laughs> I'm so small. I can't, ima- I can't understand how this happens. I'm just thinking, how did this happen? I don't mean biologically. I mean, there, how does the spirit and the body come together? When does it happen? How does it happen? I don't know. This is a wonder. This is a way beyond me. We know that babies happen, but we don't know how the spirit and the body fuse together. So we can't understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So he says, we can't predict some things, but he says, one thing is for sure. If you watch the clouds and you don't plant, you won't reap. Don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. So here's what you should do. Sow your seed. Do not withhold your hand. This is generosity. This is, this is opening your arms up and opening your hands and living like this. 
This is the way a son and a daughter, a daughter lives. You know how an orphan lives? Like this. Because they're scared. They're afraid and they want to be in control and they can't control everything, but they try and it's very tiring. And they live with their hands, their fists closed up because they, they want to keep what they have. They're afraid. But that's not the way a son or a daughter lives. We live like this because we understand the heart of our father. We can cast our bread on the water. We can sow some seeds, right? We can walk in a way that life doesn't paralyze us. Let me tell you a story about my friend, Dr. Cherian. So Dr. Cherian is a pastor in India. He's the, the founder and the president of South India Baptist Bible College. And I have to tell you a story uh, because it started over 30 years ago. It started in this little plot of field. Dr. Cherian came to Jesus. He was just a Christian. And then he became a pastor. And then he became a person who felt like he needed to train other pastors. And he was looking for a place to train other pastors. And there was this plot of land. Nobody would buy it because it, they felt, everybody thought it was, it was uh, uh, like infested with evil spirits because it was literally infested with cobras. And all it had on it was a chicken coop, one little chicken coop and a lot of cobras. So it was very cheap. <laughs> There's your real estate opportunity right there. <laughs> Buy that. So he bought the land. And you, what you do in India is you, you pay people to come, and you, they, they, trap, they get the cobras and take the cobras away, right? This is not the job I want. I don't know about you, but this is not the job I want. But they did. They, took, they, they got the cobras out of there. They took that chicken coop. They split it into one part was an office. The other part was the first, the first room of the school where they started training pastors. That was 30 years ago. Okay. And now, you can show that video. Now, there's a training center. There's a library. Is that video going to work? There's a large meeting hall. There are dorms for 600 students. They train students from India, Nepal, Burma, Sri Lanka, all of that part of Asia. He trains thousands of students now. Okay, incredible. You can show the picture of that training center. This is the this is the auditorium where where we were uh, training pastors there. It's incredible. It's incredible. How do you even do this? And what I want you to know about this man is that he's never had money. He still doesn't have any money. How do you, what happens? How do you do this? How do you get that when you have nothing? So I wanted to get a little closer. It's a gift of faith is what it is. But I wanted to get closer to him because I thought if I just rubbed up against him, maybe he, that faith would rub off on me a little bit and I could rub it all over because I need, I need faith like that. I need to be challenged and have faith like that. So he told me something very important. I asked him, tell me your story. How do you do this? He said, Psalm 78. And it was written to young generation by the older generation so that the young generation wouldn't repeat the mistakes of the older generation. So it's a history psalm. It goes back all over the history of Israel. But it says in verse 10, it says that the people of God, because it's about the faithfulness of God and the faithlessness of God's people. It says in verse 10 that the, they turned back and they forgot what God had done. In verse 17, it says they rebelled against God and they put him to the test. In verse 19, it says they spoke against God. In verse 22, it says they did not believe God. And in verse 41, it just gets to the point of it. The point is they limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited him. They said, you've done this for us, but you can't do more. Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Well, he did. How did Dr. Cherian get where he is? He didn't limit God, and he just took a step. He took a step. 
He called the people who removed cobras. That's what he did. <laughs> and he built a wall in a chicken coop. And he got a desk and he got some chairs. He didn't hold back. He sowed. He cast his bread on the water. Don't do nothing because you don't know what God can do with the little thing that you do. So I walked away with this man from this man with a desire to, to remove the limits that I had put on God. And so I put this little thing, this little saying, this little prayer on top of right above my desk in my, um, my house. This is my prayer. God, make my heart soft. Take from me an evil heart of unbelief. Don't let, help me to not limit you. Show me your ways and increase my faith. Set my eyes on your trustworthiness and put courage in my heart to believe you all the way to the promise, all the way to your full destiny in me. That's my prayer. How do you overcome paralysis by analysis? <laughs> you take a step. Greatest hockey player that ever lived, Wayne Gretzky, famously said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Just a little hockey wisdom there. Sometimes hockey players, I don't know, they get the daylights beat out of them, but sometimes they got a little wisdom. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. If you don't shoot, you don't score. And one of the greatest baseball players of all time, Henry Aaron, hit 755 home runs in his long career. He's an absolute legend. But do you know what his batting average was? Anybody know his batting average? What? Oh, man, that's awesome. That's really close. 305. 305. OK, what does that mean? It means 70% of the time he failed. Seven times out of 10, he went to the plate. He struck out. He flied out. He grounded out. He was out. But he hit 755 home runs. <laughs> and he's a legend. How do you become a legend? You keep swinging. You keep swinging. You take a risk and you keep swinging. And I think this is, I think God wants to put courage. What I felt this week as I was praying for this service is that I felt God was plowing ground and there was a big furrow there and he was pouring courage into hearts. Some of us, I think, are just at a place where we're not sure. Maybe we're paralyzed by analysis, by we, we just can't, we don't understand. Something's happened, we're, we're dismayed, but God wants to put courage in your heart to take a step. Just take a shot. You can't score if you don't take a shot. Just take a shot. So maybe, maybe for the younger people, it's this part of take a shot, take a risk, step out, do it. Maybe for those of us who are older, it's we've taken shots, and maybe we're tired. Or maybe something's happened that has discouraged us. And maybe for us, it's the message is keep swinging. That's how you become a legend. You keep swinging. <laughs> you keep swinging. But I'm afraid. I don't know, how to, I don't know what, what will happen if I take a step. I understand. I understand. When Melissa died two years ago, I had, uh, I had no idea what to do. <laughs> I don't know how to go forward. I don't know what I'm supposed to be. Without her, I don't know how to be a single parent. I don't know how to, I don't know how to take a step. And I understand when we get paralyzed or we get stuck in our grief. I get that. And I will never judge anyone who's stuck in their grief because I get it. <laughs> I get it. But I also realize that it doesn't honor Melissa or God to, be, to stay stuck in our grief, you know? What do you do? You keep swinging. You take a step. You don't limit the Lord. You don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. 
cast some bread on the water. And so you step into a calling, whatever your calling is. You, you take a step, you take a risk. And what I found was, if I can rest, I can risk. If I can rest in the Father's love and I know that I'm safe, if I know I'm his child, I know he's got me and he's covering me, if I can rest in him, I can take a step. There's some courage right there. There's courage wrapped up. Sometimes, literally, if I can just be honest with you, I'm, I mean, I'm going, I'm doing these things in the nations. It's my calling. I walk through the airport just feeling completely unable and completely broken and thinking, God, these people that I'm going to minister to should be ministering to me. I don't know if I have anything to give. But by the grace of God, you keep swinging. And you know what? He is so strong in our weakness. I can't, I can't imagine, I can't even understand the power and the anointing that comes through this, this poor, weak, broken person. It's okay, but you take a step. You, you keep swinging. You cast your bread on the water. Work to increase what you have. You you give a portion to seven and to eight. I mean, you diversify your portfolio, whatever you want to say, however you want to call that. You sow your seed. You live open and generous. You, you open up. Like Abraham, he, he went out. He didn't know where. This is a walk of faith. I don't even know where I'm going, but I'm going. God says, go. And he went out. That's the essence of faith. I don't see it, but I'm stepping toward it. And see, the thing about faith, it's not something you conjure up in yourself. You don't see it, but you step toward it, and you begin to walk in step with the Spirit, and it's a relationship. And God is deepening his relationship with you, and you're learning his heart. And as you learn his heart, you learn his heart for you, so you can rest. You learn his heart for other people, for the people that you're reaching out to. It's beautiful. And the good news in all of this is that we have a guide. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Jesus said this in John 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. We have a guide. Not only do we have a guide that knows the mind of God, Scripture says, who knows the mind of God but the Spirit of God? Then it says, we have the mind of Christ. But we have a guide that knows the future. That's a good guide. <laughs> I mean, it's not just that he knows the landscape. He knows how to operate in this kingdom, but he knows the future. He can help us to step. He can help us to take a guide there. And sometimes it just... It just takes some courage to step forward. So that's what I want to pray for you this morning. I just feel like God wants to impart courage. Maybe this is not for you this morning, but I think it's for, I think it's for quite a few of us. He wants to give courage. As we were worshiping, this is the word that came to me um, from Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 8. And this is something that was, I mean, talk about an unsure time. Moses, the leader, the lawgiver, had died. What's, and what are we going to do now? And then Joshua is the man to take over. Okay, I'm supposed to know what we're going to do now. <laughs> I'm going to lead these people. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to press forward. This is a threshold of a new place. We're going into a promised land. So here's what God said to him. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to the fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Being careful to do all the law of Moses, my servant commanded you, do not turn from the right or the left so that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And if he's with me, I can rest. And if I can rest, I can risk. So let's stand together. I I just want to pray for you. There is a future, there is a hope, and there is courage for the taking this morning. And the Spirit of God wants to impart courage to us. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for giving us a word of encouragement this morning. I know you know where each of us are, Lord. And you know where, where you want to take each of us, God. And you know our tendency to limit you, Lord, because we haven't seen you clearly enough. We don't see your heart clear, Lord. So, Lord, would you open our eyes to see you, and would you give us courage? Lord, would you plow this ground in our hearts, and into those furrows would you pour your courage, your strength, God, for this promised land you want to take us into? Thank you for doing that, God. Lord, for, I thank you, Lord, that a bruised reed you will not break. And the smoking flax you will not quench, Lord. Those of us who are broken or bruised or smoking, <laughs> just a little ember in there, Lord, you don't quench that, Lord. You blow on that. You fan it into a flame. You heal those bruises, God. You're careful with us when we're broken. And I pray for that future, and I pray for that hope, and I pray for that courage in each person here, God. And I just want also to to remind us all that this is really a picture of the gospel. Because when the action happened that brought Hevel into this whole world, When man fell and sin came into the world, God did not do nothing. Immediately, he acted. Immediately, he made a promise. There's a seed of the woman that will bruise the head of the serpent. And he set in motion at that moment the plan to fix all of this mess, to fix this hevel, to bring the chaos back into order. And it's in his son, Jesus. He's a God who acts. And in the fullness of time, the son of God came, born of a woman, born under the law, that he may redeem those who are under the law and give us the spirit of adoption that we can cry, Abba, Father. Thank you, Father. We look into Jesus this morning, Lord. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. We look into the one who took a step from heaven, who didn't hold on to his rights, but released them and was obedient even to death, even the death on the cross. We look to the one who took a step to right our wrongs, God. We thank you. And as we look unto you, Lord, we ask you to give that courage, and I thank you for that. I pray your blessing on every person here, on every couple here, on every household here. Lord, your presence and your shalom in all of us. And also, God, I pray that you would lead us all the way into the destiny, all the way into your fullness of your call in our lives. And as you do, God, that we would open our hands and help others. God, bring others into our path that the hope that's inside of us, the courage that you fill us with, we could pour over into others. God, we ask, give us more souls. Give us more people, people who are hurting and hopeless, God. Let us be your instruments, God, to be able to bring them 
to the hope in Jesus. Thank you for that. We give you praise, Father. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for what you're doing in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.